Well, they asked me why well, actually the topic for now is uh, 8211 MC and AZ. Everybody wants to talk about AZ, I see in the industry, but I think what most of the presentation is about is a recap of 8211 MC, because I think in order to understand AZ, we probably need to first really have a, some good knowledge about MC. And as you see, my colleague Dorothy yesterday, I've been presenting a little bit the use cases, and I more or less will follow up on them one and double click on the technology. So that's what I will do in my session. And I'm not sure if Jim Palmer is in the room, but the last time Jim Palmer was in the room, he hated titles always on names. So I said, okay, let's quit the title. And he named me at that time CBO, which was meant for chief bullshit officer. <laughs> so I said, okay, maybe, maybe a little bit less aggressive title for me right now. And that's over the last eight weeks, I feel myself like the chief event officer a little bit. And I want to have a big thank you to the organizers, and the last two days were really amazing from a content perspective. So thank you very much on that one. And I also, you know, there's, I am with my son here, so I want to make sure that uh, for him this is probably the most embarrassing moment that he see looking at his father presenting. So we'll only take 20 minutes, so, uh, so let's go, let's dive in. So let's take a, a perspective where we are. MC was in the full standard in 2016. So that's a significant amount of years ago, right? That's where we were. And now we're going to add AZ roughly in 2024, so roughly in the coming period, we have AZ. So that's where you put these things in perspective. I will go fast, by the way, because Key told me this is the most intelligent people in the world, so I can go fast and they can learn later. So um, we are more or less at the second generation into the third generation, all about optimizing, making it better, more secure, getting better accuracy in the market. So that's where we are. And the fourth generation, which is called BK, is underway also, or at least in development. So you can see there is a lot of traction on this market. And the reason is you can add your APs to the Wi-Fi certification. You can look if devices are you know, certified by, uh, by, by the, the Wi-Fi Alliance. There's a specific location, you can look it up, I added the link for you, you get the presentation, and here you can see the Aruba HP, that's where I work for, and so you can look at, we certified our own APs because we also wanna do locationing with our own APs, that's the reason why. One thing to stand still is that FTM is not such as a standalone thing, right? You're consuming a lot of different technologies. You can see here from security, from other standards, and I will give you the complete overview on that one. The reason why we keep on going in this, I don't think there is like the perfect location strategy or technology out there. And the location on Wi-Fi has a, has a really good, you know, in particular for indoor location, I think it has a good a good, you know, good future ahead of them, but you can see here some of the limits, right? It can be cost, it can be power, it can be that is not accurate enough. So it can be many different things. It doesn't mean that one is bad over the other. It's more or less based on what requirements do you have, what will be the outcome of the technology. Then here's uh, something that the Wi-Fi Alliance did based on power. It's a little bit Wi-Fi optimized, I think, to be honest, but I think you get the point that power is an important thing if you start doing locationing with, uh, with mobile devices. Now recap the basic principles. You saw Dorothy yesterday talking about the ping pong. So the initiator station and the responder. I made the responder in this particular case, the AP, because I think that's why we work. So you can see the FTM request, you got some messages and you do a calculation. The calculation is your total round trip time, more or less, minus your turnaround time, divided by the speed of light minus two, or uh, times the speed of light minus two. That's roughly the calculation, I get back to it. One thing, the burst on Android is eight is default, so you do multiple calculations in the same burst so that, the, so that the client can do better, let's say you get a better average, roughly, and do a better calculation. Then you do that to multiple APs, and that's where you get, uh, the client can start doing the calculation. That's in general what is going on. There is a couple of acronyms, and there's time of arrival, time of departure, time of offset, round trip time, and the speed of light. That's roughly the acronyms that you see if you start reading up on this technology that you, that you need to know what is happening. You can see in the diagram next to it when what uh, acronym means and when it, that's, that's the measurement point, so to say. Then you always set up an FTM session. 
And the FTM session is composed of a negotiation, then you have some exchange of measurements and you terminate. And every station can have multiple FTM sessions at the same time with their own parameters. So scheduling parameters, maybe other parameters. So that's good to keep in mind that you can have multiple FTM sessions depending on what applications or location services you are using. So how can you see in a beacon if you have, for example, an enabled responder? You can see here uh, in the beacon field, find time measurement responder is true, meaning my AP is a responder and can, can help you. That's how you can find if that's enabled or not. Is, uh, that's a pretty easy, will help you with troubleshooting. Then the negotiation is the initial FTM request frame is sent by the initiator. Then the responder does not transmit never, never, ever to an initiator if I've not seen, well, it should not, never, never, I'm not saying it never happened, but it should not ever do it when he has not received an initial FTM request frame. After that, communication starts flowing, so to say. So then, what must include is the trigger field must be set to one. There's a couple of scheduling parameters which we see later, and there is some indication fields that you, that you need to set. So that's a must have to include. How does that look in here? And I have to thank the people from ECAL, by the way, because the, the packet captures I always do with a sidekick because it helps me. They are so fast, it really helps me in getting it once and right. Um, in this particular case, you can see on the top, FTM request. I also need to say thank you, by the way, to this community for the, the Wireshark profile. I really love that profile that they made. Um, and you can see the FTM request trigger. After that, within 10 milliseconds, the responder needs to respond on that initial request. That's a must. So within 10 milliseconds. Then this is something new I tried. And if you find it really ugly, let me know after the presentation. We'll never do it again. But this is more or less, you have the request frame. How does it look like? Because sometimes it's hard to get all the information in one view. So here you can see the octets. And if it is a V, it's meaning a variable octet. You can see the category. There's a public action. There's a trigger. There's LCI info, etc. And you click further. Then I, what I tried to do is I tried to map it to the different IEEE chapters. Because in IEEE, it's like you need to jump to 1,800 pages constantly to figure something out. So you can use it, figure it out yourself, and jump to the right pages immediately to get that additional information. Here I did try to map it, the request frame, to what fields and what options more or less you have. As you can see, for example, 32, which is 20 in hex, is, is the FTM request frame, 33 is the following up uh, pages. You can see some of the start, stop, messages including. So I think, I hope this gives you a little bit of a one view in what means what and where you can find more information if you are interested in this. Then, looking at this, shall indicate if it is a start or a continuous sending frame, and then as a status indication. Most of the time in this particular case it's zero, uh, but it can also be one, two, or three. You can see the values in there. And what is also important is that you need to set your format and bandwidth up front in your request frame. The format and bandwidth, you can see here the full table. So you more or less say, okay, what is the, what is the bandwidth I'm using? And the higher the bandwidth, the more accurate you can do locationing. If you're using 16 or you're using 160, so to say, you also need to initiate the station, need to say if you are using a single or two RFLOs in that one. Then you get the burst, right? You get the burst of information. And in the burst, you can see this is a burst of uh, eight. Uh, that's default on Android, but you can configure that. So you get more or less seven measurements inside that particular, in that, that particular burst. Here you can see, uh, the first uh, burst, you can see where you can find that. It sets the burst information there to eight. Um, and here you can see how the negotiation and measurements uh, exchange will be. So you can see the partial TSF timer, which need to be in there. That can be used by the, um, by the uh, initiated station to sync on the timing more or less, or to verify the timing of the responder is sync with him. Most of the times, I've not seen that they use it uh, a lot, but you can, it can be done, so to say. And then ASAP, and that's a funny one, because when I was initially, at some time ago, uh, reading up on this, I couldn't find what the hell ASAP means, right? And I, th I was thinking, okay, what does it mean? And 
looking into it, and then I finally found somebody. It just means as soon as possible. <laughs> so it is more or less saying, you can get into a schedule, more or less delay it and based on the timing. Most of the time, any, anything what I've seen is most of the times on one. So meaning you just start immediately with, uh, with, the, with the negotiation. But you, there is an option in the standards to time this. So then you get the uh, FTM dialog. So you got, you're going to exchange some information. Then with the, the first dialog, there's something specific which you need to check. You can see here, now it's 33, right? 32 was FTM request, 33 is the following up messages. You can see the previous slide on the station indication uh, and on the, uh, on the bandwidth and the format. That's an important thing because the follow-up information you sent that needs to be done on the same bandwidth and format. Otherwise, they got confused. That's an important thing to remember. So here you can see a message uh, and you can see the synchronization information and in TSF um, sync info. That's only sent in the first dialog message. After that, you will not see it again. So that needs to be there in the first one. And what can be done, this is the clock I was talking about where the client can sync with the other one. And subsequent frames um, need to, uh, will not be in there. The other thing you need to remember is that if you have ASAP to one, which most of the times is done, then that uh, partial TSF timer should be uh, 10, 10 milliseconds or less than the, uh, than, than the initial FTM request frame you have sent. So, and you know that also. Um, and then here you got the following up dialogues. You can see dialog, you can see the egg, and then you can see more or less the T1, T4 information gets sent, and the client has this, has this particular data that he can use to do the calculation which we have seen earlier. So then the termination, because we need to terminate the session also afterwards. So then you can see here uh, the number of births, the duration, and what the birth period was. So that's the initial FTM request frame. And then you can see on the last one is, hey, I have my dialog token is zero, and I am at my last burst of this particular information. And then the APX and session is terminated. So then we have shared that information. On Aruba, you can enable it like this. I've seen many Cisco and Extreme and Juniper people figure out how you can do it on their, uh, uh, on their, um, on their solution, so to say. Here you can say, I have um, uh, the, w or the Wi-Fi RTT scan from Google. You can see that there is ranging information in this particular uh, information, so you can see the calculation. There's no LCI information. So on LCI, you can see here, that when you need to do LCI, it's only provided when in the initial request frame, uh, there is this one is zero, then this one is LCI. You can see here the table of what more possibilities you have, and this one should be set to remote. Then you can start getting LCI information. And then if we look at that, LCI, and this is what I meant, LCI more or less standardized is in uh, 6225 RFC. I have the data trackers in there, the Z information meaning the floor or the altitude, and the retransmission allowed field is, am I able to retransmit the information I have as a client? So there's some certain security. The retention expires zero, means default 24 hours, or maybe you can set it, okay, very short time, depending on the solutions that you have. There are some local control policies all has to do with some, some security information that you can set in order to keep some privacy or whatever. Uh, you want to achieve. Then how can you enable? This is how we do it on HP Aruba. Uh, and then if you're looking at this, you can see on the bottom, you can see latitude, longitude, and altitude information. So now you have the LCI information. Then you probably say, okay, but what about the location specific address information I can share, like street name, other information in there. That's what you can do um, also in this particular, and that's based on RFC 4776 in there. So I added that information also in there because it needs to stick to a certain standard and format. Here's some additional notes on, uh, on Android because Android has some notes about what's required if you do this. For example, on the Mac, um, but if uh, you, are not, you need to do Mac randomization, except if you are connected to that AP, then you are used to use the Mac of your Wi-Fi adapter. So there's a couple of other things. You can see it here, read up on it. That's why I left it. Here's our APs that support FTM, if you want to do something with Aruba. Um, but now you can see this is what we have right now. So, so in the market today, 
The Wi-Fi 7 APs we have will, uh, are, uh, support AZ. So there is a couple of things on MC is, you know, you need, you need negotiate, measurement, and termination. So there is like this constant procedure that you need to do, which is not like massively efficient. Also, there is no security. Right? You need to think about how can we start securing this type of data in there. It is not very scalable. It also has to do with all these sessions that you need to maintain, keep, uh, and you need there is limited spatial um, uh, diversity in order to make sure how can you first send the data quickly and how can you quicker get access to, uh, to the wireless medium, so to say, from the client perspective. You guys are far away. I'm looking at you. But, uh, so here's the next generation uh, provisioning. This is the history of AC, uh, where it is indent. Uh, you have the amendment four, you can download it uh, from the IEEE. And then where the focus is on. First is accuracy. We need to get even more accuracy, but we got more bandwidth. So we're more bandwidth, we got more accurate. And we got MIMO ranging also, uh, got also its own better improvements, in particular for non light of sight links, because you, get, you can start using the MIMO process in that one. Uh, six gigahertz is in there. There is some efficiency in there, making sure you have a single TXOP. You can share multiple information instead of doing multiple uh, sessions. And of course, the security uh, is, uh, is added in there. And here's a little bit what Dorothy shared, uh, just as a recap. So you can see that some of the security factors, we leverage what's already in there in the standards. Why do something redo? And then uh, we have some new termination process and sharing measurement exchange information. You can see the flow here. Um, and this is how we overcome the overhead. So we only negotiate once and then we can more or less share the information uh, on what we need to have. Then there is a trigger base and non-trigger base. The reason why I only focusing on trigger base because I don't think there's any uh, or non-trigger base, I don't think there's any trigger base at the moment in the market. So that's why non-trigger base is in here, where we have, we found there is a solution now to uh, more or less do a single TX up. There is using short NDP packets. Again, you can see that we are using some of the other uh, things that are in the standard to avoid longer MAC base, so we get more efficient on that one. Plus, we got use of the uh, simultaneous spatial streams, so we get better you know, less time on the medium we need to spend, so that more brings it more efficient in that one. And I don't have any time, but I'm perfectly on time, I see. So this is the things I didn't even have time to cover, right? I think uh, we can spend uh, maybe a deep dive on this particular topic, but there's many different things in the trigger base, file level security, Mac level security. There are some things on power consumption and QoS. So there's many different topics, but I hope give you a good overview, and then, I have one ask, and I know I discussed it with Keith, so I'm allowed to do this. So there's one thing. Yesterday, I had a meeting internally, and it's about the additional spectrum that we need to get in the EU. And what we are working on, and David Coleman, and this, this, is, this is just completely non-vendor related. But I have asked for all of you, if you have any use case where you are limited because of the upper 500 megahertz spectrum you're not able to use. There can be, for example, if you want to design critical services, you want to slice your network. It can be meaning anything, right? I'm super interested to get that information because we are going to do a write-up to the regulators. It's not the standard bodies, by the way. I had to say that from Dorothy before she kills me. But it's, uh, it's the regulators. And we want to get that info to the regulators. So, here you have my information, whatever you feel like to communicate with me, get me that use case, get me that information. This will, believe me, even if it is a customer that's running on Cisco, I don't care. It's more I need to use cases so that we can build up the storyline to the regulators, what we miss and what is limiting us not doing the upper gigahertz band. Thank you very much. That was my talk.